Wow, a live show. Well, it is. Um, well, shall we get the live show on the go now, darling? Oh, yes, we get it on the road, yes. And I'm not sure that wow is the right word today, but uh, we'll give it a go, won't we, Alexandra? So, um, cameraman, are you ready for us to go okay. live? Good morning from Langley, uh, BC, uh, British Columbia, Canada. Oh, hello. Hello, Langley. Um, right, so Jane Beadle, who is a former garden designer and a baking influencer, and I have done quite a few videos on planters, winter pots, winter planters, winter window boxes, and obviously questions have emerged from those videos. So I've asked Jane to join me today and to answer those questions. And so, Jane, we've got the first question, which is, pots, planters, containers, window boxes, what's the difference between planters and containers and pots? Uh, to be honest, there really isn't a difference at all. So containers are sort of the generic term. So you can have a container, which could be your pudding basin or your watering can or your kettle. That's all your pots in the garden. That's a container. It covers everything. And then under that is sort of pots and planters and window boxes and anything else really is, a con is, is part of the container family. So if you look online, the view is that pots are small, possibly used for your indoor plants, whereas containers, uh, not containers, planters are big and they're outdoors. To be honest, I think that's a load of rubbish. I mean, we've all got large pots. We've all got large planters. They don't have to be round. They can be square. They can be oblong. They can be octagonal. So containers is the family and pots and planters, I think, are interchangeable, really. Um, and winter box is just part of the whole thing. Yeah, and I would say that pots, I think, um, are often made of terracotta or ceramic or even stoneware or something like that. They're sort of more up the sort of pottery end. Although, of course, we've all got metal pots, haven't we? Oh, and plastic oh, pots. And plastic pots. You know, so I think yeah. it's all interchangeable, really, yeah. really. Absolutely. Um, now, the next question we've got is somebody who says that she would love some window boxes, but there are no nice ones where she lives. And what can we recommend? They're just nasty plastic ones. So over to you, Jane. Thank you. That's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, uh, I went to the garden centre this morning and actually not only were they not very nice planters, there weren't many plants around either this morning. Um, you could paint them. And there are lots of systems out there, painting systems, that you could use to even make it look... Oh, sorry, this is a dog poking dog around in my bag here. Um, to make them look even like metal. Uh, just make sure your pots are really clean. Then put some sort of primer or rub it down. <laughs> I think Lottie wants to say hello. Um, rub it down so the plant, the paint will key to the pot. Um, and then make sure you put a waterproof paint on them. A sort of a, um, interior emulsion won't do it. It will come off. I mean, you can do the same with terracotta pots. It looks very nice if you put something, a little bit of gold around the rim. It looks lovely at Christmas. Um, so you can paint them. And it really does help to make it sort of a pretty bright colour rather than that sort of ghastly plastic green that they tend to use a lot, or that horrible sort of fake terracotta colour. Um, You'll also find online lots of lovely wooden things that people have made. So you can plant in your plastic pots and then make a nice wooden surround, very often with cheap wood, you know, from pallets that people are always trying to get rid of when you've had something delivered and the delivery company won't take them away. Um, if you've got, if you're handy or you've got somebody who is handy to make a, a very nice sort of wooden surround, it will then have some good drainage holes in it. Paint it if you want to, and then slot your pl plastic um, container into that. Uh, it's a good way of disguising something yeah. that's a bit cheap and nasty. But you don't have to have an oblong thing on your window ledge. You could put a, an array of nice pots, <laughs> pots or planters, oh, on, on your window ledge. Um, it doesn't have to be a long thing. The thing is with winter, um, is that things don't grow really. And so you don't have to worry about anything outgrowing its pot during the winter months. So you could just have something, a very pretty pot, 
sort of round thing or that'll sit on your winter ledge um, and, and use that and just arrange them rather nicely. So there's all sorts of things you can do. Actually. And I, I think you just always have to be quite careful, particularly if your window ledges are tall up high, that it's not going to fall off in a breeze because that is the problem with little pots. Um, but you might be able to secure them in some way. I just have a sort of real fear of, um, you know, somebody putting a whole load of pots along their windowsill on the third floor and then a pot being blown off in the breeze and landing on someone's head. Landing on the postman. Yes. Yes, well, we, don't want, we don't, really don't want that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, well, then there's another question we've had is what kind of pots actually last through the winter? And oh dear, I, hope that, I hope you're not hearing too much of that whining from the dog. And the thing is that here in the southeast of England, we have quite mild winters. It's quite rare to go below minus six Celsius. It's actually now quite rare even to have freeze. However, mm. you could have two or three days of frost. And the pots that really don't do well are terracotta because they absolutely absorb some water. And then the freeze comes and the water, either the soil in the pot swells or the water in the, in the terracotta swells because it's frozen. And then, of course, it, it melts again and it goes back again and it cracks. So that's really not so good. But of course, most other things for us, like stone or metal, are really, there's no problem. So I decided to ask Erin of the Impatient Gardener YouTube channel, who has some lovely planters for all kinds, for all through the year on her channel. And so I asked her, because she's in Wisconsin, she's in zone five, she has months of snow. And it can go down to minus 20 Fahrenheit or minus Ooh. 28 Celsius. So I thought, well, we'll find out what pots survive where she is, and then we'll um, have a good idea. And what Erin says, I've got her answer here, is that fiberglass is really the best. Anything made from resin or fiberglass will probably be the main thing that survives the winter. But there are some terracotta pots that are made to be seriously weatherproof, but she says those are really quite expensive. She herself has got quite a lot of cheap terracotta pots and she has to protect those in the winter and she takes them into her garage, which is still below freezing, but not as exposed as the rest of her garden. And what she then does is that she um, uh, she will put them not on the ground. And she says this is the key that if plant pots are on the ground, they get a lot colder and they're a mo lot more likely to crack. So she has them slightly raised up and she stores them in her garage which although below freezing is not that cold. And she also says that plants, big plant pots sort of wedged into the soil sometimes don't seem to freeze as much mm. because there's quite a lot of warmth in the soil. Um, but whatever you do, don't leave your pots in a sort of saucer with some cold water. We've also had a question um, about whether, if you have any comments on the use of these large plastic pots, which have got double skins with a hollow uh, volume in between the inner and outer uh, shapes, if that, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Actually, they're, they're pretty good. Um, and it's very often a trick that's used actually in metal planters as well. Basically, you're... Sorry, can I just say that yes, I'm course. not sure because David, who's behind the camera, is not mic'd up. I don't oh, I know see. if people okay. have heard that, so I'll say it again. So we've had a query on the chat. What do you think about those planters that have got double skins? So they've got an inner and an outer. Um, I think the other... I think... I think they could be pretty good because actually one of the tricks if you were using a metal planter in both the winter and the summer um, and uh, metal it gets very cold and it also gets very hot and can uh, wreck, wreck the roots is uh, put a layer of bubble wrap. Now I'm not a great one for using plastic but it's great use of using your bubble wrap and, um, and not making it single use uh, is to put a, a layer of it in inside the pot. So I think these double skinned uh, plant, plastic planters do very much the same job as that bubble wrap does. It sort of insulates um, and it's a great way of actually insulating in the summer and the winter from excessive heat or excessive cold. I've never tried them to be perfectly honest. We, as Alexandra said, we don't have that sort of low temperature here um, but I think it would be a really good thing to try. Yes. So I've got another question which I think said um, I, I get mould in the pots when the, when the plant dies. What do I do? Well, I get mould. Uh, I get mould in the pots when a plant dies. What do I do? In the pot, or it, 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 do you think that the mould is killing the plant, or 
uh, is it on cycly on the pot? I'm not quite sure. I think it would be a reasonably is. good hygiene thing would be that when a plant has died in a pot, that you give it a good scrub out. I mean, you know, washing up liquid, domestos, a, a fungicide, you know, a, a fungicide and mm. give it a good scrub and, and air it. So I think it would be worth, because if there is a mould in your pot and it's it may be being passed on to the next plant, that could possibly be the problem. Yeah, it's good hygiene whenever you use the pot. And it's the most boring thing in the world to actually scrub out a pot that you've just used. Um, but if it's actually mould on the pot, again, use the fungicide to get rid of it. And the, the, the problem is on some terracotta, if you've got any sort of damage and that shiny surface goes a little bit, is you may get some mould or some lichen or something settling into the pot. But you can generally scrub it off and then give it a good clean and hope, hope for the best next time. And actually, I'm just on the subject of lichen, in fact, lichen doesn't kill things and it's not a sign. In fact, you, you only get lichen if you've got a really very good atmosphere, a very clear, unpolluted atmosphere. Mm. So if you like the look of lichen on your pots, you like the look of moss, actually leave them there because they really won't harm your plants at all. They won't harm the pot. They yes, just simply, they, they look gorgeous, I think. I mean, I'm a great yeah. fan of fan of moss and lichen. Yes, yeah, I am too, but it depends on where it is, I think. <laughs> Exactly. There's a place for everything. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, well, what about uh, going on to winter pot planting ideas, Jane? Yes, well, it's great fun as a rule. And we've done some nice trips to the nursery in the past and, and got very excited. Um, and very sadly this morning, I did not get excited in the nursery. I don't know why, whether we've got trouble here getting things into the nurseries or import mm -hmm. i don't know but there was very little choice this morning um but the thing about winter pots for planting i mean if it's a huge container you, you can plant loads of things from from small fruit trees and underplant with herbs and all sorts of exciting things like that which is not probably a bit dead in the winter so for winter pots you can go mad really go to the garden centre. I mean, last year we planted some beautiful red stemmed cornice in window boxes because the interest in a winter planting doesn't have to come from flowers and not necessarily from leaves. There's some beautiful stems out there. And wander around and have a good look and then what we tend to do is get our trolley and, and put some selections of plants together and see whether they look nice. And if they look nice in the trolley, they're going to look gorgeous in your window box or your planter. And also have a good root ground. If your nursery is a bit like mine this morning um, and you had to scratch around to find something that's going to be a bit interesting, always poke about and see whether they put some of the plants that are possibly a little past their best. And I'll show you what I found this morning. And it's not dead, I promise you. As a lot of people, my husband thinks it's dead. So I have this, which is a very large, it's a Carex Comans bronze. Now it's not dead, this is the colour it's supposed to be. But a couple of these were tucked out of the way because they were considered, I suppose, not particularly buy me, buy me sale worthy. Okay. The beauty of this is, it, it was £5.50, so what's that about? Mm. Six, seven dollars, I suppose. But it needs repotting. And I had a good look at it, and I'm going to divide this into three. And each little tuft will look fab in a window box. It's got lovely, I don't know whether you can see, it's got some lovely orangey tints in there. And then, look how sweet that looks with some cyclamen. And, and also, here we go, oops. And then some beautiful ivy. And this all tucked in to a pot will, or a window box yeah. will look absolutely stunning. So if you can't find anything really brilliant, have a look and see where they think something's a little bit tired and see whether you can make use of it. But I would say don't always look for big plants. Very often you can find rooted cuttings in places um, and little boxes of say maybe a leucothoe or euonymus or... They're all the common or garden shrubs. All, so, you know, exactly. They come in little packs of six and we get them little packs of assorted six. We and, do. Um, we bought some last year, didn't we? And I put some in the garden and put some in pots and they've grown like mad. I think we've got another question yes, coming. Um, coming. On the mould in the pots, the mould comes first in the soil and the plant then appears to die. 
as a result of the mould. Oh, I see. Well, it's... Kick and move people. Sorry, yes. So we're going back to the mould question. It is the soil that's creating the mould. It, or come the, the, the mould comes onto the plant, onto the soil, and then the plant seems to die. Um, it could be that the soil is getting quite damp and waterlogged. It could also be that this is not particularly good compost. Um, I mean, yes, very often... certainly don't use that batch of compost again yes. if you are. But uh, yes, and I would say drainage is probably quite an issue because if, if it's a very... You know... Another similar question. Um, how do I get rid of algae in my bird bath without using any bleach? I have been... Oh, oh sorry, yes. Uh, how do I get rid of algae in my bird bath without using any bleach? I have to say, I've been using household vinegar. Uh, once again, you've got to definitely rinse it off because birds will not want vinegar. But um, I think household vinegar does it quite nicely, really. Okay. And possibly, uh, possibly bicarbonate of soda as well, because yes. it's a wonderful household cleaner bicarbonate of soda without being too uh, caustic. Okay. Another question, cyclamens, I'm getting some cyclamens. How do I tell whether they should be indoors or outdoors? Oh, generally, oh, sorry, sorry, I just went, sorry, you can't hear David asking the question. Um, how can you tell whether your cyclamen is indoor or an outdoor plant? Well, it should tell you at, in the nursery, and but generally the big blousy ones that look as though they're a house plant are a house plant. Um, there's some very hardy outdoor ones, the cyclamen coom, and they're just flowering now and, and are in the shops and are lovely. And they have these sweet little almost heart shaped leaves they're very pretty in shades of pinks and whites um, and they're as hardy as you like um, and then there's a cyclamen heterofolium which you're probably not going to see in the shops right now and what that does is that comes through in in the spring and the flowers come through first and as they die down then the leaves come out and it's called cyclamen heterofolium because it has leaves in the shape of ivy leaves which are lovely and then you get these little ones that i brought out earlier, which are very common here in the UK at this time of the year. And, you know, you might think they're not particularly hardy. And if they get too wet, they will rot off. You know, they, you don't want to plant them too deep. Um, but, and the white ones seem to rot off more than the mm. reds and the pinks. But we've planted these in window boxes over the last two or three years, and, and I hate throwing anything away. So we then plant them in containers in the garden or tuck them on the shady side of the garden because they, they don't mind a bit of shade. And as long as you plant the, some of you can, oh, messing up the table here. Um, they have like a big comb. Don't plant them too deep because if that goes too deep, they can rot as well. Um, but you might lose some of these, but Generally, you can save at least two thirds of the ones you've used in the window boxes. And mine from last year are just about to come into a flower again and will be glorious for Christmas. So a long answer to a short question. The big, blousy, indoor looking ones, and you will find those indoors at the garden centre and probably under plastic in this country if people have got polytunnels. Um, ones like this are probably more in their outdoor displays. If they're displaying them out of doors, then you can generally use them out of doors. If they're keeping them indoors with the house plant fertilizer, they're generally house plants and won't survive out, outside. Um, well, we're now at the question we've got here is the easiest way to plant a winter pot or winter window box. And of course, the way I've done it, which is easy sometimes, is I've got the winter window box or the window box, and I've just bought the plants in pots and I've just actually rammed the pots in. I haven't taken the plants out of the pots. So I've rammed the pots in and actually you can get quite a nice, uh, quite a nice display. And also when something goes over, you can just pull one pot out and then put it back in. But I think Jane, you aren't wholly in favor of that. Well, to be honest, during the winter, it's not too much of a, an issue because things are not trying to grow and move out of their pots. Um, but I much prefer to, I probably don't change all my soil, actually, from my summer. I'll take out half of my soil. And I like to put bulbs into my winter planters um, because they give you that extra interest. You've forgotten you planted them, to be honest. And then up they pop in the spring and you get this added sort of, 
belt of colour from either tulips or, or miniature daffodils or something like that, which I don't think you can do if you're just shoving pots into a container. So I'll take out half of my soil, I'll put a layer of bulbs in, I'll then don't put more soil on top of those bulbs straight away. Put your, take your things out of your pots, put them into your container and then fill in with soil around because otherwise you put in soil and then you've got to dig some of it out to make a hole. Um, and I find that's just so much easier. And if they do decide to grow over the winter, they've got somewhere to expand to. Uh, yeah. But you've, if they don't grow, it doesn't matter because you've just, you've got your daffodils or your little tulips or your whatever you want to plant in your bulb form coming through those those gaps that you've left, where if you can't do that, if you've got plastic pots in. Yes, there is one other easy thing, which I, I've actually seen people recommend, and it, it is quite a nice, easy way of doing it, which is to put only one type of plant per pot. And this can be really quite effective. If you've got, oh. say, six or seven different pots, instead of doing the thriller, spiller, filler thing, which is where you've got a uh, something up high, uh, something trailing and some flowers and that looks very pretty too but if you don't feel confident with that actually putting all your tulips into one pot all your daffodils into another filling another pot with grasses you can then move them around and I think that's quite an easy way of looking quite effective what do you think? I know I will absolutely agree and the lovely thing is about planting pots with um, bulbs is you can tuck them away in the corner of the garden and put maybe a bit of netting over to stop squirrels or rodents eating them and then as they're coming through, move them into a nice spot in the garden. Um, yeah. um, I have a tree indoors. My fiddle leaf fig has been suffering from not enough light or humidity. Is there another variety of ficus better suited? Um, this is actually a query about um, an indoor plant called fiddle leaf fig, and it's not doing very well in um, somebody's asked a question about that. I'm not particularly hot on houseplants. I think you could move it to a, a lighter place. There are quite a lot of, I, I think I would just Google that. I wouldn't like to be the person to tell you what to do with your houseplants because I'm afraid my houseplants would not really um, agree that I was a responsible person to give that sort of advice. Uh, Jane, are you a houseplant uh, fiend? No, or? I, I kill houseplants. Yeah, I'm afraid, I'm yes. I'm great then. outside. I have very <laughs> green fingers for outside, but houseplants, I'm really not very oh. good at. Monty Don recommended to plant tulips deep in the soil. Do you share the same opinion? Yes, Monty Don uh, said strange? plant... Yes. Monty Don said uh, plant tulips deep, and I completely agree with this. When I first started gardening, I planted, I was told by someone else, by Sarah Raven, in fact, to plant my tulips deep. And I planted some tulips so deep that I will never be able to dig them up again. And they came back year after year. And of course, when you're planting them very deep, um, they're not so easily reached by things like squirrels. But also, I think there are various reasons why they actually do better. I think with tul tulips coming back, there's absolutely no guaranteed, mm. this is what you can do. I mean, honestly, you could plant the most wonderful tulips deep marvellous, half of them will come back, the next year a quarter will come back, but then maybe for the next 20 years those remaining quarter will come back again and again. So uh, there's no surefire recipe for getting your tulips coming back, but planting them deep is certainly a very good thing, in my yes. view. Uh, planting them deep and planting them late, because yeah. you avoid, or do your best to avoid tulip fire disease, which if you plant them too early in, in the autumn, um, then you stand a chance of getting tulip fire disease. So I haven't planted mine yet because my garden is still flowering and I don't really want to chop everything back. I think I'm going to have to. But um, yes, if you plant your tulips in December or even January, if you can get hold of them. But I was talking to a great friend of ours who is a flower farmer um, and she will plant tulips for, you know, selling for not not the bulbs, obviously, the, the flowers. Um, and she just discards her bulbs because she said they don't come back reliably. And they, especially some of the really fancy species ones, mm. they, they've they kind of been grown to do it once or bred to do it once. Um, and it seems awful. I, I like the simpler tulips, to be honest, because they seem to just come back year after year. Yes, I agree. Um, well, also, we've had a question on the best plants for a shady pot. Now, uh, one of the things I think is worth saying is actually you can plant any plant in a pot so 
really the best plants for a shady spot. Uh, but over to you, Jane, what do you think? Well, I, yes, it depends on what, what time of year we're talking about. If we're talking about plants for winter, which we started talking about, I think you can plant almost anything that looks good um, for the winter because light levels are so different and they're not going to get much more on a north facing wall than they are on a south facing wall and they're not doing a huge amount of growing so they don't need a huge amount of photosynthesizing and things like that so in the winter i would put anything that i think looks nice and is going to cheer me up in the spot that it's going to be planted something that will grow for 20 feet if you plant it in the garden but you plant it sort of sort of nine inches to a foot tall in a pot is going to look stunning and if you you know you can then put it in the garden or if you're like me i've got a tiny garden um pass it on to friends who've got larger gardens so i think in the winter almost anything goes but I, you really do need to plant something that's going to cheer you up because that's what winter planting is all about yeah. and then summer planting is a whole different ball game i think and then there's another um, question is what kind of winter pots or planters what would you do on a front porch and actually, we were talking about this earlier, and I was you raised the um, issue that actually a front porch, you have, Jane has plants in her front garden. But she doesn't actually have a porch, but a porch is quite an interesting environment, isn't it, Jane? Well, I would say a porch is an enclosed space. So, you know, you've got a, an outer door and then a porch and then your inner door to go into your hallway. And it's a brilliant space because certainly in the uk it might be a bit colder in the, for you guys in the us um because it protects plants from the worst of the weather and also because it's so close to the house it'll be warmer and mm. a mutual friend of ours firm uh, told me when in fact you were both at garden design college together oh, right? yes and she said that they used to plant the daffodils out from the college from the building and you could literally see that the daffodils closest to the building were getting the heat of the building and they would flower mm. a good four weeks earlier than the daffodils that were right down mm. over there. So, of course, presumably it's exactly the same with a porch and with very close to the front of the house. It's actually a warmer place for plants to be. Oh, a much warmer place. And a lot of people will bring some of their tender plants that they've got in pots into the porch to protect them over the winter. And you could even grow some of the flowering things like that lovely blue plumbago um, in a porch so it's, it's a great growing space. Should I tie up my yucca over winter? Oh should you tie up your yucca over winter? Yuccas are certainly in the UK they're pretty tough the yuccas and I wouldn't think you need to tie it up over here to be honest I don't know what the lowest temperature is for a yucca um, it might be worth Googling it and seeing what the lowest temperature is. And do, if you get a lot of snow, I would say brush the snow off on a regular basis because that's the thing that will actually start ripping, ripping it down. Um, but other than that, I think it should be fairly tough. I think it's because it's, I think it's quite a desert plant. And the thing is about deserts is that they get quite cold at night, even if they're in very hot places. So, I mean, I think possibly check yuccas for, for what your climate is where you are. But I would say mm. that actually, you know, well, certainly for something like a zone eight or zone nine in the States, British South East England, um, absolutely no problem. We had a yucca outside our house in London and it was a magnificent object mm. and it just adored being outside all year round in London. You so, yeah. care, don't, when you're brushing it off, you don't spike yourself because yes, no, they're was. a bit evil. <laughs> <laughs> Evil plants. Yeah. Yucca can stand very low temperatures or below freezing. Yeah. Oh, thank um, you. Somebody said it, it will yes. withstand very low temperatures. So yeah. you don't really need to tie it up. You just don't want snow damage if it, the weight is bringing down the uh, the leaves. Okay. I, I've been growing canna lilies in pots. How best to overwinter them? Canna lilies. Um, I would have thought bring them indoors. Yeah, I think a, a greenhouse or a, a, a frost-free place. I'm yes, very shed. similar, very similar really to dahlias um, because uh, cannas won't survive, you know, very cold, nasty, wet winters. So if they're in pots, I would take them into the shed, the greenhouse, mm. the garage. Um, you know, if your garage is really cold, you might wrap them in bubble wrap or straw or hessian or something to protect them. 
And once again, Erin from The Impatient Gardener says, just keep them off the ground because the ground is really quite cold. If something like a you know, concrete or stone garage floor or a stone terrace, uh, you don't want your pots dead against that. So that's why people say put, put pots on pot feet, which I never, ever do. No, I don't. Uh, just sorry, can I just before you go on to the next question, David, uh, um, the thing that kills plants more than anything is to sit in wet, cold soil. So when we're saying we're taking things in, just that are going to go dormant like a canna lily, you need to keep that soil dry. Um, anything will survive more or less in dry soil in the winter, in, in really deep frost. It's once you get the water in there and then they freeze and then you blow the roots on, on something. So it's the watering that's usually the thing, thing to rot off. Do you feed bulbs once they begin to emerge? If so, what do you use? Uh, do you feed bulbs once they begin to emerge? And if so, what do you use? In fact, I did a blog post and a video on this oh, yeah. uh, okay. in the spring, and I consulted every single authority, the RHS, the every bulb grower, and I did a great sort of chart of it. And um, what definitely emerged is don't put fertilizer in with bulbs when you plant them because they're not growing and they don't take it up and it will be as if it were washed away. But once they start growing, a lot of people do recommend adding a fertilizer. You could use a liquid fertilizer of seaweed feed, organic fertilizer, and that you can use them. But I have to say bulbs like daffodils, which are pretty good at coming back, somehow seem not to need it. And I'm slightly against doing something you don't have to do. But Jane, what do you think? Well, my view is, and I'm no expert, but my view is that if you've got a lovely plump bulb, all it, all, every ingredient it needs to turn into a beautiful daffodil, hyacinth, tulip, whatever it is, is already in that bulb. And so feeding that bulb is not really going to help it a great deal, even once it starts to come into growth. I would make sure that I don't cut the, 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 the leaves down too early. Um, they do say six weeks from when they finish flowering, because it's going to take all the goodness that it needs back into the bulb from the photosynthesizing and, and you know, sunlight and all that sort of stuff going back into the bulb. I wouldn't waste your I wouldn't waste your money with yeah. the fertilizer. To be perfectly honest, I don't find that it's necessary. I, I would agree. Okay, I'll ask you quickly. I plant mostly in containers. When planting bulbs in containers, um, should they be watered in? And then, is it necessary to water the containers at all over the winter? Now, this is an interesting oh, yeah. question. This because mm. I was just getting on to another question we've got is somebody who plants their bulbs entirely in containers, she waters the container when she plants the bulb, but does she need to water over winter? And actually this goes on to a question we've got here about how do you care for pot plants in pots over winter? So I think we'll handle that, those two. What do you think, Jane? What yes, okay, I mean, it'll, it'll co be covered under that one. Yeah, as we, as we move down. that's where we are really. So oh, that's where we are, yeah. okay. So, Going back to what I said a little bit earlier, you have to be very careful that you don't overwater your your stuff in the winter, um, because if you get soggy soil, and and very often those plant those planters those pots those window boxes, depending on which way they're facing, will get quite a lot of water without you having to run out with a watering can. In fact, I hardly ever water in the winter at all, um, and. It, the, the thing is, if they do get too soggy, and again, going back to the feet, you've got to have good drainage. If they get too soggy and then it gets frosty, or even if it just gets very soggy and sits in a lot of water, the roots might rot off and then and then die. So I would say water them in. Always water in once you plant um, initially, and then be sparing with your water. You probably won't have to water much more than once a month depending on where they're situated, but just go and stick your finger in. And if it's dry an inch, two inches below the surface, then don't worry about it. Have another look in a month's, in a week's time. Okay. Next question. Um, can we plant herbs together in the same pot? Yes, we, uh, can we plant herbs together in the same pot? Yes, absolutely. And it looks mm. great. It's a really nice thing to do, actually. 
and and herbs are pretty usually pretty sturdy so they won't you know worry too much about the competition so no great thing to do it is a great thing to do again make sure the drainage is really good because most herbs um like good drainage really good drainage make sure you're putting plenty of grit into your pot because again they won't like being soggy um, and I would keep mint separate because mint is absolutely rampant. And similarly, um, sage, I'm uh, not sage, oh, tarragon. Tarragon takes over as well. So yes, do mix up your herbs, but just be careful with tarragon and mint. Absolutely. And then back to um, caring for winter pots and planters, because I actually find that I never ever water any pots outside in the winter because they just seem to get enough rain. Mm. Um, I have noticed in the last few years we've had some very dry springs and I have found myself at the beginning of spring doing some watering. I have to say I don't feed plants in pots during the winter because they're not growing. Would you agree with that? I, I would agree. I'd just go into the watering though. Say you had a big beautiful rhododendron, sort of every evergreen rhododendron in a pot. The, the leaves are going to form like an umbrella over the pot. So, you know, our pansies or grasses or sycamore that we're planting for window boxes allow plenty of room for the water to get in. But a dense shrub in a pot might just sort of shed all its water. So you, that would be the one thing that I would check in the winter, something with a very dense green canopy. Yeah. Um, what was the rest of it? Oh, feeding. No, I don't bother to feed. They're not in growth. Um, once they start into growth in the spring, um, then you can give them a little bit of a feed, but you're probably going to change your... Your, your winter containers then and plant things out into the garden um, but if things live permanently in pots yes you need to top up the compost and yes you need to keep them fed in the growth i want to attract the right type of critters to my garden what are the best plants for this ah now interestingly yeah. is that this ties up um we've got a question i want to attract the right sort of critters to my garden what are the best plants and this very much ties up with another question we've had which is is container gardening good for the environment um, the critters to the garden is really about the whole garden, whereas containers in the environment is the second one. Um, in terms of attracting the critters, what I would say is uh, flowers for as much of the year as you can. And local or native plants are really good because they attract the flora and fauna that really like your area. In fact, the RHS has done quite a lot of studies in this. And they say a mix of native planting and, um, and and wider planting is really good because quite a lot of insects and birds and things are adapted to use, you know, to get things from quite a wide variety of plants. And so variety is really important. Local and native is really important and long flowering, you know, so that you've got something coming up in February, something coming up in November and all the, and everything between. So, Jane, so if you start with the getting critters to your garden. Yes, get, uh, Alexandra said an awful lot of it, you know, get as many plants and natives. And I grow um, something that's considered to be uh, a weed yeah. in my garden, which is very pretty little purple thing called Lunaria. Um, and it is home to the Lunaria moth and caterpillar. And most people pull them up. Um, but they're really pretty and I just love watching the caterpillars. Sometimes I get as many as 30 on one plant and then the sparrows come and eat them and, and, and some of them survive. And, it, you know, so don't be too fussy about the plants. Don't fill your garden with really complicated flowers either. Uh, and by that, I mean, all, the, all these beautiful double, triple, you know, where you can't see the centre are gorgeous for us to look at but there's nowhere for the bees and the insects to get into the pollen that's very well buried underneath those very, very complicated and beautiful flowers. So simple flowers where you, as they open, you can see the center or, or they have the, um, the tubular things like uh, in penstemons or foxgloves and the bees go up there and get very cross and buzz about and get covered in pollen. So you need a variety of shapes um and scents and whether they open in the evening like some of the tobacco plants or in the height of um uh, the, the the daytime because then you're covering the moths and the evening insects and the bees and the butterflies that come out so a good a really good variety and there are a lot of winter flowering ones as well i mean there's um 
the, the Christmas box or, you know, Saka Koko Confusa, which gives you the most gorgeous scent, planted by your front door. We're going back to a porch, but planted by your front door in a pot, evergreen, the sweetest scent in January, February. There's um, the Daphne's are beautiful, and any insect that's out on a, a, a slightly warm, sunny day in January, February will thank you for that. Um, if you've got a larger garden, there's a, a winter suite because it says it in the name, sort of Chimenanthus praecox. So have a look and see what lovely winter... Oh, there's, there's loads. There's the winter flowering honeysuckle, which is a shrub, actually. Um, there's so much out there. So, yes, look and see what's out at what time of the year. Um, choose the colours, obviously, and the shapes that you like, and some nice leaves, and uh, you can't go wrong. Um, I'll order some roses to grow in containers. How do I look after them over winter? Oh, looking at, so um, somebody has ordered some roses to grow in containers and wants to know how to look after them over the winter. Um, and actually, roses are super easy. They, I don't know whether you've bought them as pot grown or as uh, bare rooted roses. And very often for winter planting, we'll buy bare rooted roses. And basically, they come with no earth on the roots. So you find them in a brown paper bag or something, and they'll turn up. Um, just heal them. If you don't want to plant your containers up straight away, just heal them into a trench in the garden and then dig them up when you're ready. Just all you need to do is stop the roots that they've got from drying out or put them into a pot and just follow all the things that we've said before. Um, don't overwater them. Water them in first of all. Keep them moist but not soaking wet over the winter. Roses are incredibly resilient. They don't mind being waterlogged, actually. They don't mind the frost. They don't mind clay. They don't mind a dry soil. I think roses are the most amazing plants and don't get enough uh, good press these days. Everybody yeah. thinks they're a bit old-fashioned, but I really love them. Yes, I, I agree. I think they, they do very well. Mm -hmm. And and they're also just slightly back to the critters again. If you can have even one tree in your garden or one more tree, because trees actually support usually something like 300, a single tree, 300 species of uh, wildlife in terms of animal, uh, birds, little animals, you know, funguses, um, insects. It's extraordinary what one tree can do, and even quite a small tree in your garden. So that's another thing to think of. Yes, I mean, and all sorts, and don't be too tidy. So, you know, everybody goes out and tidies up their garden and rakes all the leaves out at this time of the year because they look messy. They're wonderful habitats for overwintering insects. So make it tidy so you can bear looking at it, but don't make it so awfully And also tidy. safe, so that because leaves do trip people up, so paths do happen. Oh, yes. I mean, clear paths and things, but don't clear all your borders. Okay, that's a question. I've, I've got purple loof strife in that's my, it. In my yes. garden. I have heard it spreads. Should I dig it up? I think pers purple loose strife is what you were referring to as not lunaria. I've got purple loose, stri loose strife in my garden and it, it it's fine. I mean, it does spread a bit. Obviously, things spread differently in different areas. So if your garden, your climate, your weather, your soil is very different from mine, the purple loose strife will spread differently. But to be honest, it is a very good, like many weeds, it's a really good wildlife um, plant. And so I tend to leave mine. I basically probably pull out one in uh, about three out of four of the purple loose stripes I pull mm. them out I leave one and I think that's sort of what I'd say yeah yes I do exactly the same so yes and they're very easy to pull up as well they're not like some of the really invasive weeds yeah I've grown strawberry plants from seed which are now very strong little plants what should I do with them next should I keep them indoors until spring or should they be planted out at some point this is strawberry plants. Oh, I don't know that either you. Um, it's a question over strawberry plants. I personally am a very bad veg grower, um, and I'm not sure I've ever heard you say anything about veg. <laughs> so are we going to admit to being bad veg growers? Well, I did, oh. I did actually start, because I've got a tiny garden and not really much room for veg, and I did try and grow a lot in pots today. Oh, you did, yes. I did try, well, the pots are sort of big compost bags. Um, and to be honest, the uh, dog, goes and helps itself to the tomatoes. So I'm really not terribly good at them. Um, but tomatoes... Um, but strawberries. Oh, sorry, strawberries. I beg your pardon. Uh, strawberries are fairly tough, actually. It depends on where you are in the world. But 
um, if you want to mollycoddle them a bit longer and then plant them out in the spring, I would just keep them either in a, a, a bright spot, um, but in you cool know, and where frost it's free. cool yeah. and frost free, but they don't need to be warm. Um, hi, I've planted out two gardenia crown jewel. How hardy are they? I have bubble wrapped them. Um, is this sufficient? I live in Shropshire, UK. Right. Oh, hello, Shropshire. Hello, Shropshire. Um, somebody is planting gardenias in Shropshire, UK. I don't have the facts right now as to how hardy gardenias are, but I think you could just um, look it up on the internet. Mm. I don't think bubble wrapping something that's planted in the garden is a particularly good idea. I think it's either hardy enough to be planted in the garden or bring it into a shed or a greenhouse and and protect it that way. I don't think bubble wrap really works in a, in a garden situation. No, what do you think? I know, I, I would say, and I, to be honest, although I did say you can insulate your pots with it, I mean, bubble wrap does disintegrate and it's not a great um, environmental thing to use out of doors. Or, um, fleece, I think, a horticultural, horticultural fleece, fleece is much better. Be better yes. But going back to gardenias, I don't think they're hardy, and I could be wrong, yeah. um, but I think they are more or less indoor plants. Um, I'm not an expert, but I, I would be very worried about gardenias out of doors. I think what I would suggest is keeping the gardenias in pots and having them in a sheltered mm. place, you know, possibly in a porch, if you've got a greenhouse, any kind of conservatory, light bright indoors. Um, mm. I'm sorry, we haven't been hugely expert on the gardenia side here, but I think you might lose them if you plant them in the garden. I, I would say so, yeah. What pot material do you think works um, uh, good for plants, especially during winters? Oh, uh, is this compost? Um, what pot, pot material? Pot. Oh, pot. pot. Material. Oh, pot. In, in the, 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 the actual, the, yes. The, the make pot. Okay. Uh, Basically, we, um, we actually... Um, went over this a bit earlier so i'll just cover it um briefly for people who've already been heard it uh essentially fiberglass is probably the best material if you have very harsh winters terracotta will often there is frost proof terracotta but really good frost proof terracotta is quite expensive the cheaper terracottas they absorb water so that if you have a freeze then the absorbed water freezes it cracks and it breaks it open um, Erin, the impatient gardener, um, gave us quite a lot of advice on this. And actually, she's got lots of lovely uh, pot things on her channel, so it's worth looking at it. Um, but she says, really, fibreglass is the best, uh, or the very expensive terracotta. Oh, wood's not bad, actually. Uh, wood's okay, wood, actually. Wood's okay, too. And, yeah. me and metal would be fine as well. And but metal makes the plants quite cold. Yes, I mean, it, it does. It, it also, and in the summer, it makes the plants quite hot. So metal, you'd have to be in a bit of a sheltered spot, I think, for yeah. metal. Can you overwinter plant in a shed? I'm worried about it making the shed damp. Oh, can you overwinter plants in a shed? Um, um, I have, <laughs> sorry, you would say. My shed is so drafty. Uh, I've got a wooden shed, and my shed is so drafty, I don't have to worry about damp. Because shed doors are sort of rackly. Um, plants, I don't think plants will make the sheds damp. But equally, damp is a problem where you've got a very well insulated, very enclosed, you know, houses that have got double glazing are much more likely to have damp than great big drafty houses. And when you've got a drafty shed and there's a hole under the door, and I don't think you'd worry about damp. <laughs> Probably not, I've got a very drafty shed as well. Um, but the thing is, if you're overwintering in a shed or a garage or anywhere, um, things are not growing in the winter so they don't need watering very often and it's that obviously the damp is coming from the moisture that you're putting on it unless you've got a leaky shed um so don't overwater just a, a you know a, a teacup full on a in a planter should be enough to keep things going through the winter yes just stick your finger sort of right down into the soil and see if it just feels all completely dry then give it a small amount of water. Yeah, yeah. But there shouldn't be enough water in your plant compost to cause problems with the damp in the shed. Otherwise, the plants will rot. As yes, well. and they're not growing. They don't need it. So uh, just enough to keep them alive, really. Do you have any suggestions for a small, colourful plant to have in a pot outside the front door during the winter? Um, do you have any suggestions for a small, colourful plant outside the front door in the winter? The trouble is that I think is that obviously it depends where you live because there are some places 
uh, where it's far too cold for some plants, whereas where we are here in southeast England, there's quite a range. I mean, cyclamen would be fantastic. It's lovely, bright pink colour. Um, what, what do you think, Jane? Yeah, yes, it depends, again, what, what you want. I would be inclined to put together a nice combination of plants or you know, a single com single group of plants with the, the cyclamen. Or if you want to go for shrubs, get some nice leaf-coloured shrubs. So um, a leucothoe. Uh, Scar uh, Scarletta, I think, is it has lovely glossy lanceolate leaves, small, um, and has purples, purple sort of magentary leaves, um, and that's rather lovely if you want to go for shrubs or put something with a scent in. Um, put a nice a Daphne's prefer to be in the in the ground, but you could put a Daphne in. Um, in a large pot for the first couple of years, and they will be wonderfully scented coming up after Christmas. Uh, the reason we do winter pots uh, with combinations is because one plant is not going to do it all for four or five months. So if you can put a combination of plants in, you will get a succession of flowers of interest. And, and have I, can I show the pot that I've got here, David? Because you are, yes, can I? So this is one, not necessarily to my taste, but it was a, a oh, a gift. It was a gift, so I thought I'd show it to you. Um, it's a bit too, too many colours for me, but, um, and it also goes to another point, another question that we had about um, how well you plant. Again, going back to things aren't growing in the winter, you have to cram your winter planters full of plants because they don't spread like they would if you were planting them in the spring. So in, in this tiny little pot, there are two cyclamen, there's some viola. Does it need to be held up? Oh, it doesn't no, no, need to be no, held no, up, no. no, 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 no. There's this thing keep, that I can't remember what it's called that's got um, a red berry on and I can't remember, we put this in a winter box, I can't remember what it's called. Um, there's another viola here and there um, are some primulas. And then in the middle here, is um, this wonderful silver leaf cineraria, which is great in the winter because it looks quite frosty, doesn't it? So this isn't totally my taste because there's just too many colours in here for me. I like my planting a little bit simple, but it just goes to show how many plants you're putting in a pot that is probably no more than about 25 centimetres across. And I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or eight plants in that pot. So you could put a combination of uh, plants together that you think are looking absolutely lovely um, and that will make your front door step look really cheerful. That's what we're trying to do in the winter is trying to cheer ourselves up whenever we go out, out of doors when it's all a bit gloomy and rainy. The only thing I would say is winter flowering pansies um, are completely misnamed, I think, because they tend not to flower in the winter you buy them and they've got a few flowers on them and then they sulk right the way through to March so I tend not to plant winter flowering pansies because um, they don't do what they're supposed to do but yeah just put together a nice pot and, and then you'll be really cheerful when you get home every day I'm going to put this on the floor sorry I'm trying not to wrench out my microphone can I leave a pot of, can I leave a pot of uh, eucalyptus under the lean to all winter I should think so. No, I would. I yeah. think so too. I would think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes. <laughs> Can I leave a pot of eucalyptus under the lean-to all winter? Yes, I would think so. Um, I mm. think that, that the thing with eucalyptus is there are a huge number of varieties, and so they do vary in their hardiness a bit. So you could be unlucky, um, but on the whole, if it's been bought where you live, and nobody said this is an indoor plant, I think you'll be fine. Um, it, you could be unlucky, but on the whole, I would say with eucalyptus, pretty hardy plant, just leave it where it is and see how it goes. And if you're particularly worried, just wrap the pot in some horticultural fleece. If I'm planting annuals, do I need to fill a tall pot or can I put an upside down pot or other material in the bottom of the pot to save using... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Soil? Yes, absolutely. Fill it with what you... Oh, sorry. Should I, yes, shall sorry. I? Shall I? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm just, if they're planting annuals in a pot, and it's a big, tall pot, do they have to absolutely fill the whole pot with compost? Or could she put an upside-down plant or something else in there so that she uses less compost? And Oh, yeah, I, absolutely. I used to use, you know, you can get... Um, 
half a dozen plants in a polystyrene, plants in polystyrene, which is ghastly stuff because you can't get rid of it and it doesn't uh, uh, degrade. But if you crunch it up and use it in the bottom of a pot, you can, you know, it, it was really good for the drainage. It doesn't collect water too much and it means you don't have to put too much soil in. So yes, put anything in to uh, take up half the space and cut down on the compost and improve the drainage. In fact, there's a reply to that one also. Um, the answer is yes, I put water bottles at the bottom of yes. a giant pot, then place a planted pot on planted pot on top. Yes, yes so that's, that's somebody um, who's putting water bottles in empty plastic water bottles into their planter and then putting the giant pot on top. And, and that's certainly something I've done something very similar because I've got some huge great old dustbins and really, you know, the plants don't need that much soil. Yeah, so yeah, it really is helpful. Um, we've got a question here, which is, is container gardening good for the environment? And one of the things I think people feel, well, you know, it's just a little window box, which is just a little pot. And you know, is it really doing any good? Because how much can live off it? But I think one of the things to people are trying to make everyone aware of at the moment is about wildlife corridors. Mm. So you may have a park, say, a mile from your house, and you may have perhaps um, some big grand garden two miles in the opposite direction. But it's very difficult sometimes for wildlife to get from one to the other unless there are lots of little stopping off places. So if you think about your pots um, or your window box or anything that's got flowers, that's got pollen, or anything like that, seeds, it's just like a little stopping off pot. It's almost like a cafe that the, the, the insects and the birds that are going from one to the other, they can stop off and have a little bit of enjoyment. And that's why container gardening actually is incredibly good for the environment. Well, it is because not, I mean, we're very incredibly fortunate that we've both got gardens. Um, but for people, you know, my son, for instance, or my daughter, both just have balconies. Um, and, you know, it's great for the environment. It's also great for you. Um, let's not forget that as well. I mean, if you're just looking at some sort of sterile street, then you might be a bit glum. But if you look at people's wonderful window boxes, not only are the insects and the bees and the birds loving it, but you're loving it too. And let's not forget that we've got to be cheerful about things. Um, something for me to bear in mind, talk about portraits in America, of course, there are lots of houses with verandas around the front. Is there anything in particular you want to say about that in this context? Oh, so the, uh, David's sort of talking about verandas in, in the US, and I love some of those wonderful wraparound verandas and, and some of the houses that you guys have in North America. Um, it works much the same, really. You know which side gets the wind or the really, you know, snow blowing in. Um, just make sure that the, the, the way you walk to your front door or the bits that you get to, you know, make it beautiful to cheer you up in the winter and then use every available, I think, use every available planting space in the summer. Are there any important things to keep in mind while making compost? Um, the most important thing with compost, really, I mean, people talk about complicated things. You've got to have a third brown and a third green and everything. I tend to just throw everything in. There are two ways of making compost. One is easy and one is fast. And you can't have easy, fast compost. Easy compost, you throw in everything, you chop it up as much as you can, but if you don't, you just throw it in, just keep, keep on throwing it in. And in about a year, year and a half, you'll have compost. Fast compost is you chop things up and you keep the right proportion of greens to browns, which is things like grass clippings to wood chip and things like that. And if you have it all chopped up very small and you've got the percentages right, you'll get compost in about three months. So that's quite a difference. And you have to decide what sort of a person you are, whether you're somebody who wants to mulch things and chop things up and keep, you know, keep an eye on quantities or whether you're somebody like me who just wants to bung something into a pile. Um, and you just have to be aware that the bung in a pile compost takes much longer. Yes, it does. I, I'm rubbish, actually, I'm making compost. Um, but we have a very good supplier down the road. Actually, we a very interesting point though for compost or, or soil improver is very well rotted horse manure. Um, and we were watching um, we we were watching somebody's video the other day, and they said you have to be very careful with the compost with the horse manure because. If they've been grazing on fields where there have been certain sorts of chemicals that will actually pass through and end up 
in your compost. So be very careful where you source your well rotted manure from, otherwise it could be transferring chemicals that you didn't know about. Yeah, so that's specifically something called aminopyrrolids, and they don't break down in horse okay. or cow's intestine. And they don't break down when they're sort of well rotted. But oddly enough, they do break down if you kind of put them on your beds and you don't plant anything in the bed for three months, you'll be all right. But if you uh, put these this manure contaminated with amino pyrolids straight onto something, it's got little bean shoots. The little bean shoots will just die. So die. it is, I mean, it is really, it's why sort of organic manure is much mm. better because they won't have amino pyrolids in it. I have two dwarf maples that have been in pots for many years. Would they be healthier in the ground? Or is there something I can do to keep them healthy in their pots? I would say that I've got two dwarf, sorry, I've got two dwarf maples which have been in pots for quite a long time. Uh, should I, would they be healthier in the ground or should I keep them in the pots? I mean, I would say just go up a size of pots. What would you say? I would say much the same. I mean, I always used to say when I was gardening for people um, and they would wonder why their gardening wasn't flourishing and they hadn't mulched it or fed it or fertilised it since it had been planted, sort of 10 years. And I say, you, you wouldn't feed your children once they were born and then not bother to feed them until they were 10. Um, and I think that's the problem with a lot of container gardening and ordinary gardens as well. So, yes, uh, you know, go up. Don't put it in a huge big pot. Just go up sort of another inch or so either side and an inch depth if you can afford to buy a new one. Otherwise, take it out of the pot, shake out some of the soil that's, at the, you know, around the roots, put some new compost in, put it back, give it a feed and, um, and then water it. Uh, it is difficult. Pots, pots for trees get very expensive. I've got a cherry in a tree ornamental that really does need a new pot. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I don't think I really want to to fork out for a new big pot. So there, you make sure you keep the soil at least with some nutrients in. But I would say it'll get pot bound if you, or they will get pot bound um, if you don't do something about it over the next couple of years, I would have thought. When I bought my topiary spiral, I've got a topiary spiral, and the person I bought it from said, take it out of its pot every two or three years and root prune it. And okay. that's quite an interesting mm -hmm. one because you just cut the roots almost as if you were pruning a rose or something. And you just cut the roots back a bit. And as Jane says, shake out the soil and then put it back into the pot with the new compost. And then, of course, uh, a slow release fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And then once the slow release fertilizer has expired, which is usually what, two, three months, then during the growing season, which is really summer, um, just give it a weekly uh, liquid liquid feed and it should be fine because they sort of don't really mind not growing too much they don't have to keep on growing they can sort of become a bit bonsai and in fact well, exactly find that, you know mm. they'll the trunks will get thicker and more gnarled but that could be really quite nice mm. Mm. i found some redwood winter greens gold gold here procumbens mm. uh, i'm in new jersey zone 7a they look beautiful for winter I'm really hoping there will be a good ground cover in the spring. Any thoughts? Oh, funnily enough, I was absolutely looking up wintergreen or Golfaria. Oh, this is a question um, from someone who's got some Golfaria. They're in New Jersey. They're a zone seven. Redwood. And they um, want to know what we think about them as ground cover in the spring. I think they'd be great. I was looking up actually wintergreen to see how hardy it was. And it goes right down to a zone three. And I don't know how cold a zone three is. In winter but it's very cold oh, okay and very cold indeed so wintergreen golf area will be really fine uh, it, you know throughout the winter and actually i think as a ground cover in spring it'd be charming i think so think? Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. let's this the last question um do roses i'm sorry the last question do roses in pots survive winter outdoors uh this is going to be the last question do roses in pots survive winters outdoors and um, yes, once again, there are a huge number of roses. They are mostly very hardy. But it is worth checking your rose where you are, because in the thousands of roses, there are a few that are more tender than otherwise. But as we were saying earlier, we think roses are pretty much bomb proof, really. You can stick them almost anywhere and they will do pretty well unless, you know, you have a complete sort of Arctic, some kind of perhaps a 
I don't know, a glacier comes down and envelops your house. But in that case, I think, I think perhaps you might not be worrying about the roses in that case. But yeah, no, no, maybe not. Yes. I mean, I, d I tend not to grow roses in containers, and I'm assuming these roses are roses that were designed for containers because roses love to let their roots grow free. Um, but I would have thought they'd be absolutely fine. And if you're at all worried about them, again, just rock, wrap the pot in a bit of horticultural fleece. I, mean, as I said, I don't think they even mind being particularly wet. They will grow in soggy clay and do very well. So yeah, roses are just about bomb-proof, yeah. I think. Um, uh, can you wrap up now, but also to answer an earlier question by Claudia, can, can people uh, see a recording of this later? Yeah. Um, there will be a recording. This will uh, process out for an unknown amount of time, but after it does that, you can find this, see this recording again on the middle sized garden and it will be like any other video. And I might also try and do an edited version of it and cut out some of the bits and do it as a shorter video, but you'll certainly be able to see it on the middle sized garden. And I will also put in the description links to our winter pots uh, videos, our winter window boxes videos, and to Erin the Impatient Gardener's uh, YouTube channel and also to anything else we've mentioned. Yeah, I think that's about it, isn't yeah. it, really? I mean, thank you, everybody, for, for all the questions. It's been great. It's our yeah. first... Our first one, yes. Yes, so our first so live. It's been brilliant. And uh, have a lovely evening, or indeed day, if you're in that part of the world where it's breakfast. Um, you've had lots of uh, responses. Um, I just read one out. Thank you, ladies, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. This has been amazing. Oh, thank oh. you very much, everybody. Lovely comments. People are so kind. They are. They really are so kind. I know. Yes. Bye. Bye, Bye all.